This is a horror film, not the usual kind featuring haunted houses, creepy creatures, ghosts, or ghouls. The stars are people who could be your neighbors, ordinary looking people conducting innocent looking business in a business-like way with the ordinary machines of modern technology. But what you see here should be more frightening than other horror films, because this is a true story. It's going on right now, and you are the target. Your rights as citizens and union members are supposed to be the victims of this crime. of lunatics. In fact, they're members of the United States Congress, the newest and most effective frontmen for the new right-wing movement. Now, it invents a multiplying number of front groups. Instead of gathering behind the banner of a candidate or an issue, it's in place, the ready reserve, ready to spring into action on an issue, support a candidate, even seek a candidate where there isn't one to suit them. It's invading public life at every level, working not only for candidates for president in the United States Congress, but for state legislatures and local offices. More and more, it relies on public officials as their frontmen, mouthpieces. More and more, it uses disguises and fraud. And behind it all is the sophisticated use of computer technology to raise more money and organize more people faster than ever. The goal is to strip the trade unions of the legislative and political strength they must have to protect their workers' jobs and all of the important aspects of their lives as American citizens. And this is how it works. A room like this one is the heart of the new right wing's political operations in this country. It's tidy and usually unattended. And it's double locked and electronically sealed. It houses an enormous computer system containing the names of about 10 million people who give willingly, generously, and automatically to their favorite right-wing causes and candidates and organizations when the right buttons are pushed. The list grows daily and so does the right-wing war chest, because these people are programmed to write a hefty check every time a vicious right-wing anti-union appeal lands in their mailboxes. There are two ways to get people excited enough to give their time and money to a cause. These are hope and fear. They plant and fertilize the fear with distortion and outright lies. But they've gotten smart. They clothe their misrepresentations in sober, respectable-looking, often official-looking wrappings. Well, look what happened, for example, to two well-established and respected United States senators, Frank Moss of Utah and Gail McGee of Wyoming. Each lost his seat as a result of a right-wing hatchet job featuring new and effective organization and wide distribution of an objective-looking article in a respectable-looking publication. In each case, the weapon used to accomplish character assassination was a collection of lies and gross exaggerations, and the innocent-looking, modestly-dressed publication was spawned by the ultra-right-wing John Birch Society. This fact was mentioned nowhere on its pages, of course. What happened to Moss and McGee happened in other races, and the same guns are loaded at the hearts of other candidates. The new right doesn't rest after election day. That same bogeyman, fear, works just as well to churn out the same weapons. Distortions and misrepresentations aim directly at progressive legislation which might help working people 
poor people, old people, average people, just trying to make ends meet. Oh, they're out to get OSHA and kill workers' protection on the job. And they want to send public employees back to relying on favors and patronage and to prohibit them from organizing into unions. Oh, they're the J.P. Stevens of the political arena. No union representation in politics. And they do it with this. Tons of mail. These, then, are the weapons in the new right's arsenal. Dollar power. Something the right wing has always had in abundance, as well as some new powers. Technology power. Based on its sophisticated computer and direct mail operations. Manpower. For it has learned its lessons well from its labor and liberal adversaries on how to organize and mobilize mass campaign. And yes, brain power. In fact, especially brain power. The new right wing has grown tough, pragmatic, and systematic in devising its strategies. Like other kinds of assassination, character assassination requires the services of a skilled, experienced man. His name is Richard Vigory. Now, you've probably never heard of him. But he's the brains behind the new right wing, a founder of its most effective organizations and the principal link between them and others. In defeat or elect a man. And we're convinced with... He's come to be known as the godfather of the new right. ...that will defeat. The secret of his power lies in his mailing lists, the very best in the country. Through his lists, he can reach, in a matter of days, an estimated 10 million true believers of the right. Anyone who ever contributed to or worked for a right-wing candidate or cause is on his lists. He's created an empire by using them in an effort to destroy all the things we stand for. ...all forms of mass communication in the country, radio, television, newspapers, magazines, except one, direct mail. And oh, sure, the right-wingers get into other issues, but always, when they want to press the buttons, they come back to the anti-union theme. It's their bread and butter pitch. Now let's meet some of the supporting cast. Reed Larson, head of the National Right to Work for Less Committee, is a big-time operator with a staff of 85 a budget of five million dollars plus, and an enormous direct mail operation once aided by, you guessed it, godfather Richard Vigory. The committee, which now handles its own mail operation, sent out 25 million pieces of mail in 1977 alone. Enough mail, in fact, to earn it its own private postal zip code. This is Joseph Coors, Brewer, and anti-union zealot. His politics are as bad as his dealings with his workers. He's trying to break his workers' union at his brewery, and he's trying to bust all unions through his funding of the ultra-right Heritage Foundation. Here's a man who needs no introduction. A grade B actor turned grade B politician, Ronald Reagan. Although reminiscent of the shoot from the hip, rough riding old right, he's become the single greatest hope of the new right. Now, one of the organizations they operate through, under, and in between. The groups they have cleverly woven into their intricate web. Well, they're harder to watch because they overlap, interlock, coordinate, and multiply like rattlesnakes. Many exist only on paper. Don't represent much of anybody. Some bear crude and hostile names such as Committee to Defeat the Union Bosses, and most hide behind innocent-sounding names such as National Action Committee. Many are spin-offs of Richard Vigory's operations and serve simply as fundraising vehicles, a means to sell another used concept to the gullible and the devout. They roll monotonously off Richard Vigory's political assembly line. Occasionally, the name of an old, familiar enemy crops up, 
the National Right to Work Committee, for example, or the John Birch Society. Now, you may be asking, how do these groups present a threat? Their most effective device is the use of members of Congress as mouthpieces. Right-wing congressmen and senators sign right-wing fundraising letters, usually on their own congressional stationery. Way down at the bottom, it says, not printed at government expense. As for the senators and congressmen who sign these letters, almost all are officials or former officials, fundraisers and fund recipients of many ultra-right organizations. Senator Carl Curtis, Republican of Nebraska, Conservative Caucus, Young Americans for Freedom, Heritage Foundation, Committee for the Survival of a Free Congress. Senator Jake Garn, Republican of Utah, National Right to Work Committee, Committee for the Survival of a Free Congress, Heritage Foundation. Senator Orrin Hatch, Republican of Utah. Americans Against Union Control of Government, National Right to Work Committee, Young Americans for Freedom Conservative Caucus, Fund for a Conservative Majority. Senator Jesse Helms, Republican of North Carolina. Americans Against Union Control of Government, Committee for the Survival of a Free Congress, National Right to Work Committee. Senator Strom Thurmond, Republican of South Carolina, Young Americans for Freedom, American Conservative Union. Congressman Lawrence McDonald, Democrat of Georgia, John Birch Society, Committee to Defeat the Union Bosses, Conservative Caucus, Committee for the Survival of a Free Congress, American Conservative Union. Congressman Philip Crane, Republican of Illinois. American Conservative Union, Heritage Foundation, Young Americans for Freedom. There are many others just like them from all sections of the country. If any of these so-called public servants represent you in Washington, you'd better watch what they're serving you. It could be poison. And then there's the special case of freshman Congressman Jack Cunningham Republican of Washington, who won a special election recently in the state of Washington. It's a classic example of how a candidate is absorbed by and helped by the new right political organization and pays it back with interest. The National Conservative Political Action Committee, a vigory front, provided Cunningham with campaign management, media advice, mass direct mail fundraising, identification of voter support, and a get-out-the-vote program. Its fundraising provided a large share of the $429,000 Cunningham spent. But Cunningham wasted no time in showing his gratitude. As soon as he took office, he wrote a fundraising letter on his own congressional stationery for NICPAC, the National Conservative Political Action Committee. And in it, he launched a vicious attack on the labor movement, declaring that the AFL-CIO support of an Election Day registration bill clearly meant that, quote, George Meany and the rest of the big union bosses are hell-bent on seizing total and final control of our entire election process. The new right wing has had phenomenal successes in recent years and is preparing itself for even greater successes in the near future. Richard Vegary says he expects to raise $35 million this year for over 100 congressional campaigns for three to 5,000 state and local campaigns nationally and a variety of other right wing activities. When he says he intends to be in three to 5,000 races in 1978, that means his operation extends not only coast to coast, but from the highest to the lowest level of our government. Virginia is a good example of what he has in mind. As this Washington Star chart indicates, the state is well organized by the new right wing. It's fertile ground for Vigory's vicious campaigns. In the 1977 Virginia governor's race, 
Vigory engineered the defeat of a good friend of labor, Henry Howe. Vigory was responsible for a massive direct mail campaign for Howe's conservative opponent, John Dalton. There were four letters from Dalton and a vicious anti-Howe letter from Representative J. Kenneth Robinson of Virginia. There was some false statements in the letter. Robinson admitted later. Too much later, however, to lessen the damage. And no wonder Howe said the election was a victory for Vigory. In that same state at a lower level, Vigory was responsible for a fundraising appeal for a member of the Virginia House of Delegates. The appeal, signed by a United States representative from clear across the country, Robert Darnan of California, warned Virginia voters of the threat of big labor bosses. These are just two examples of what is planned for the future. To handle the load, Vigory will double his employee roles to nearly 600. In the meantime, the 450 corporate political action committees, which contributed $5.8 million to 1976 political campaigns, will greatly expand their programs in 1978 and beyond. They'll easily triple their funding. They're not officially a part of the right-wing web, but most will support most of the same anti-union programs, candidates, and causes. The corporate PACs are a new force to be carefully watched and seriously reckoned with. Add Vigory's $35 million to some $18 to $20 million in corporate PAC money, and you've got a $50 million plus war chest to oppose our friends and support our enemies. A horror film is supposed to have a happy ending. After the monster has scared us out of our wits, we should enjoy watching its destruction and go home relieved and happy. The ending of this film has not been written, but together we can write it. Remember the weapons? Dollar power. They've always held the advantage here, but there are more of us than there are of them, and if we each give a little, we have enough to do the job. Technology power. Machines work for us, too, helping to organize campaigns, telephone banks, precinct work, direct mailings. Manpower and brain power. We've always had these in abundance, along with energy and determination. The weapons are the same, but the ammunition is very different. Instead of lies, we use truth. Instead of personal attacks, we use issues. Instead of hate, we use compassion. Instead of cowering in fear, we walk in hope. We now know what we are up against. An intricate web that has a way of clinging to the dark corners, of growing constantly to ensnare, entrap, and often to triumph. But we are stronger. We have the collective strength to act in our own best interests and destroy the monster ourselves. We are the principal target of the right-wing machine. But we can beat it. You have just seen hard evidence which confirms a danger to your union and your contract which is greater than any that we've faced in the past 40 years. Speaking for myself, to my fellow members of this great union family, I intend to do everything possible to counter this threat, to alert all of our members to the attack on our union, indeed, on the entire trade union movement itself. I hope all of you will make the same commitment, because we've got a tremendous stake in this battle. To those who have been members of the IAM for a good many years, I would say that we've worked far too hard to build our union, to sit back now like clay pigeons while the union busters fire away with their big guns. To you younger members, I would say don't ever kid yourselves that your union and your contract are perfectly secure. As long as powerful interests are determined to wipe us out, your union, your contracts, and your very jobs are imperiled. You have a big stake in this struggle too bigger than the rest of us, perhaps. Only your union and your contract 
has the potential to protect you throughout your working life. Without them, you have no voice, you have no rights, and you're absolutely defenseless at the job site. And this is no red herring. The danger is real, and it's immediate. The vandals are loose, they're striking at you and your union, and they're going for our juggler. The question is, what do we do about it? One thing we don't do is roll over and play dead. We gear up and fight back. First, at the job site, we've got to be more alert than ever, well in advance, to any management effort to weaken our union. Believe me, thousands of employers have taken seminars and courses given by the professional union busters in the decertification procedure. One of those employers could be yours. Politically, we've got to work to arouse all of our fellow members to help to inform them, to motivate them to repulse this attack. And we have to do it at the polls next November. The Machinist Nonpartisan Political League is our first line of defense. We've got to collect as many dollars for MNPL as we possibly can so that the Machinist Union can help its friends against this flood of right-wing and corporate money. Every local union should seek a checkoff for political contributions as soon as possible. Our headquarters staff or the office of the MNPL can help you on procedure. Where you don't have a checkoff, every member should be approached to give $2 to the MNPL. If you don't have a local union MNPL committee, get one started immediately. When it comes to registration of your members, to informing them, to getting out the vote, there's absolutely no substitute that will do the job like a full-time functioning local union MNPL committee. We've got to communicate with our members at the job site, in our neighborhoods, and in every possible way. We have to reach every single member with the facts of this all-out assault against our union and the entire labor movement. We can win this fight, but we have to work at it. I, for one, intend to make this a priority from now to next November the 7th, which is Election Day. I ask you, every one of you, to join me. The union you save, the contract you save, and yes, even the job you save might be your very own.